It's over to, uh, to Yitzchak. Kol Hashem Lo, sounds like everything that he has. But there's something he didn't give him. What did he not give him? So, so the Pasuk says, Vayten Avraham et Kol Hashem Lo Yitzchak. Avraham, everything he has, he gives to Yitzchak. And then something special, something unique, something that, that wasn't included in everything that he has, he gives over to Bnei Apilakshim, to the children that he had from the, the concubines, the children that are less destined for glory, less destined for greatness. So, to the children, the sons of the Pilakshim, Abraham gave gifts, and he sent them me'al Yitzchak beno. Very strange pasuk. So Abraham has these gifts that don't belong to Yitzchak or that aren't part of everything that he has, and he sends them not to Yitzchak, not even through Yitzchak. He sends them above him or beyond him, outside of him, to the uh, to the, the descendants, his children from these concubines that live in the east. So the Gemara once again Masechet Sanhedrin. That's two for two tonight. The Gemara says, uh, what is it? What are these gifts that he gave them? So the Gemara explains, Shem Tum'ah Masarayim. He gave them a name of, uh, of Tum'ah, like unholy or impure uh, incantations. Sure, I have some. If you want them, I can give them to you too. I mean, like, why would anybody give this to anyone? And what's the purpose? What's the entire, what's the point of this Pasuk? <laughs> why do I care what Abraham gave to the children that aren't Yitzchak? Maybe Ishmael figures somehow into the big picture. These are B'nai Pilakshim. So Rebbe explained that uh, there was a very intentional purpose in Abraham giving these um, these impure gifts to these children that apparently weren't shayachim, they weren't uh, so attached to uh, to kedusha. He gives them these uh, these uh, incantations, these unholy shemot uh, that have uh, capabilities, except that they operate through uh, through tum'a, through impurity. And what's the idea? The idea, Robert B. explained, is that they should create a chilul Hashem, but one that actually has positive results. In other words, when you take a concept and you use it so repeatedly, you repeat it, you go over it a thousand times, and you pass it on to your children, your grandchildren, everyone around you, the concept loses all meaning. That's it. It completely dissipates into thin air. It, it means absolutely nothing. You want a really good example? Because Rachel wants a really good example. You have a child, and you say the word no, right? Never happened to me, maybe it happened to you. <laughs> Yohan abstains from the discussion. <laughs> okay, so your daughter wants something. And you say, lo. And then she says, I want it. And you say, lo, and I want it. And a thousand times you say, you know what? Just, just take it. I, I don't have the call. It's not worth a fight. <laughs> you don't even know what you're fighting about anymore. It was an artik. It was like a, you know, like a candy or something. What you've just accomplished, right? Aside from really bad parenting, no offense, Rachel. We'll talk about it after the shiur. <laughs> what you what you've just accomplished? Do you think infants are abs uh, absolved of this? <laughs> Terrorists also. Yeah, no, that's just it. But but they learn. What you've just accomplished is a tremendous chilul of the concept of no, because I taught you that it means nothing. It means nothing. I said it a thousand times, and in the end, I gave in. So don't say it. Don't even bring it up. The. Uh, Rav Shem Shalom Rafael Hirsch, that's a beautiful, very German uh, definition of, uh, of parenting. He said the purpose of parenting, this is like Torah, Orthodox, Jewish parenting, is to use the word no as rarely as possible, but to mean it. <laughs> so my goal is not to tell my kids don't do anything, because if I say you can't do anything, I'm saying no all the time, and something's going to give, something's going to break. I, who's, I can't go here, I can't go there, I can't do this, I can't, I can't go to his house, I can't go to her house, so I can do nothing. I can't do nothing, I'm going to do something, and here you lost. You said no a thousand times, but one of them was... So he said, to use the word no as rarely as possible, but to make it stick. So can I go to his house or to her house? Can we do this? Can we do that? I don't know about this. You can do this. But if I say no, it has to mean something. If I said no, that's it. You can cry, you can kick, you can scream, you can call your grandparents. It's not going to help. It's not going to change. Yohan doesn't know where that came from. I don't know either. <laughs> but, but it's not it's not going to change the psak. It's not going to change the ruling. Because the word no, it means something. So Rebbe explains, what does it mean that Abraham sent these concepts to the to the east? It says, <laughs> He sends them to the land of the east. So he said, Indian culture has a lot of influences from Torah, 
uh, a lot of uh, spiritual sensitivity. Uh, much of it is very impure and completely wrongly practiced. But they do they do maintain certain concepts. They call their uh, chachamim in the, in the Hindu uh, Brahmans like uh, descendants of or students of Avram. So, is it is it where do they do they actually have a history? I don't saying think I don't think they themselves understand this. There have been studies. There are papers written on this. There's a lot of uh, Torah yeah, concepts that coincide, and even time wise, it makes sense. Because I'll bring a fight with my colleagues tomorrow. <laughs> so with your Indian colleagues. Yeah, Rabino. Yeah, yeah. yeah. copy your tea. Uh, Either one, just decaf would be good. Either just decaf. Thank you. Anybody else? Tea. All right. No caffeine. No decaf tea? Just regular tea. Regular tea. Decaf tea? No. Great. So, uh, so basically what I'd like to explain is like this. There is this concept of impurity. It's a fact. It's, it's a part of life. It is what it is. And just like Kedusha is susceptible to, uh, to Chilul, to desecration, how is it desecrated? By giving it too much use, or too much access. It becomes meaningless, it becomes pointless. So too, Abraham understood that it's possible to do damage to Tum'ah by allowing it to go through the same process. Not a good example, I'm gonna give you a bad example. A bad example because I don't like it. If someone happens to dress inappropriately, okay, whatever inappropriate dress means. When you live in a society where everyone dresses appropriately and one person doesn't, that person attracts a lot of attention, right? leaves an impression. People see this, so let's say it's a woman, just because that's an easy example. So the guys see a woman like this, and all of a sudden she gets attention. The girls see this, they say, if I want attention, I dress like her, and this is how the whole snowball of Tzniot uh, begins. When you live in a society where most of the members of the society don't care about these concepts, it's not as powerful, you know? So it's a concept that, that's been desecrated, it's been weakened because it's already been so... Uh, well, cliché is the technical term for this. Like, it's, it's so used, it's so hashed. Like, we've been there, we've done that, it's not even that interesting, that exciting anymore. Um, I can give you uh, infinite examples of this. I, I happen to... <laughs> I used to work with this one guy in a, in a slaughterhouse, an exceptionally unpleasant man. I mean, he worked on this, he had a PhD being the most difficult, annoying person on the planet. And he was very successful at it. Uh, and and we'll this guy, like that. right. But the man used to curse all the time. The guy couldn't get a simple sentence out of his mouth. He would see my kids, he would curse and he would apologize. So, you know, if someone lets a four-letter word go every so often, you say, To, Hashem Rahim, you know, what happens, it is what it is. Uh, you would say he had a temporary lapse, uh, lost control, or something. Someone who uses these words all the time, I mean, it just doesn't mean anything anymore. Right? This is like he says good morning this way. <laughs> this is supposed to, uh, so I'm supposed to react, oh my God, he said that, I, I must have done something wrong, I have to be careful. When you use it so many times, you use it so often, it just, it loses its sense, it loses its meaning. So Rav Rebbe said, this is what Abraham was trying to accomplish. When, when you give access, even to deep secrets in Tum'ah, they become completely uh, worthless, completely useless. You want a really good example of this? This is a good one this time, not a bad one. Um, my grandmother said the same thing that Rav Sabato said a little bit more uh, eloquently, a little more sophisticatedly. That uh, she said this about about the word uh, Allah in Arabic. She despised the fact. My grandmother hated the fact that they used the word Allah everywhere, all the time, a thousand times a minute. Well, yalla, for example. Yalla, smalla, right? No, really, <laughs> walla, which, by the way, is it's like a it's like a shivua. It's it's the way of saying by God, you know, or in the name of God. Uh, Bismillahi, you know, everything is in the, in the name of God. Smalla, like the name of God should be on you. Um, repeating it so often doesn't make you more observant. In fact, it has the opposite effect. It becomes something so common. It becomes something so meaningless to you, because you used it so many times, you've, you've diluted the meaning. Every time you use it, it becomes meaningless. Compare and contrast with Judaism, where whenever we refer to Hashem, we don't even use the name. We refer to Hashem as Hashem, literally, the name. The name that I'm not going to repeat. Why am I not going to repeat it? Let's do the math. Uh, it used to be that people did pronounce the name of Hashem when they were in a state of purity, when they were making brachot during tefillah, Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur, at least uh, a few times, would, uh, would enunciate the name of Hashem. Why would we stop using the name of Hashem 
at a certain period in time. I mean, what's the point? If we're trying to pray to Hashem and we're trying to make direct references, wouldn't it make sense that we use it more often? So if I want to improve my spiritual level, I want to go further, I want to do more, I want to achieve something, I want to become an Avi, I would say, yo, use the name of Hashem a hundred times a minute. But it would have the exact opposite effect. The lower level of spirituality that we, we reached, the less permission we had to use the name of Hashem. It's not special for you. It has to, you have to take a break, take some distance, think about it, reflect on it. You can read it out of a sidur, you just don't pronounce it the way it's written. And this is a way that we're trying to repair a, a literal Chilul Hashem. We, we use the name so much without understanding it, without meaning anything by it, it just became so, you know, not a big deal that we had to take a step back and, and relax ourselves. Yeah, don't use it for, for no reason or for meaningless things, but there probably we understand that you shouldn't uh, swear for false testimony, but, you know, still it, it has to mean something. And this is true everywhere. You find this, the halachot of Talat HaMishpacha, the halachot of Nida, same concept. A little bit of distance makes something have value, it makes it have meaning, it makes it have, have uh, depth. Uh, it becomes more important. And when things have no controls on them, and you do whatever you want, so the, the, the institution itself loses its value. That's, that's just the way it is. So, uh, we come back to, uh, to Perkhi Avot. Yoshua ben Prachia is giving us advice. Maybe he's giving advice to... Uh, to relatively simple people. It doesn't really sound that way, but we could, we could learn the Mishnah either way because there are two uh, equal opinions. Um, maybe he's giving advice to Dayanim. Maybe he's giving advice to rabbis or to, uh, to judges, depending on how we understand the whole of Pirkei uh, Avot. What's the advice that he gives? If he's talking to Dayanim, Maybe it makes a little bit more sense. What he's telling you is, first of all, you need to find or make for yourself, establish for yourself a Ram. which means to acquire, Liknot in Hebrew means to purchase, to acquire, to make something uh, yours. Knelecha uh, Haver would be, so you have a, a responsibility or an obligation to acquire uh, a friend. And your, your goal, maybe we're talking literally about a big din, is to judge everyone favorably, meaning two people come before you in the Bedin. Don't assume anyone did anything wrong until someone proves this to you. That's all. You're innocent until proven guilty. That's how we say in English. Innocent until proven guilty. Maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. Maybe she did it, maybe she didn't. I don't know. Let's hear the case. Let's hear the proofs. As far as I'm concerned, everybody's innocent. There was a misunderstanding. That's all. Interesting question that we have to ask is uh, when we say, is he talking about two different people? In other words, are these just my social obligations? I need to have a rav, and I need to have friends. Or is he saying, really, you should uh, establish a rav for yourself, and you should make an acquisition, make a friendship out of it, make something meaningful out of the relationship. Don't just uh, assume that this is someone that I uh, call only when I have problems or troubles, and uh, I'll make a disclaimer, call me with your problems or your troubles, I don't care. <laughs> this isn't uh, Facebook. If someone needs something, feel free, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not... I don't want you to reflect from this on your relationship with me. Do whatever you want with me. But we're talking about uh, people on a, different, uh, on a different level, on a different plane. Is the advice, uh, is he referring to two different people? Is he telling you you should you know, establish for yourself a rav and you should find yourself a friend? Or is he telling you these are two, uh, two good pieces of advice? We're going to look into it. We're going to compare and contrast with the, uh, the Mishnah. Uh, nine Mishnah uh, later that appears to repeat the same piece of advice when it comes to making a, uh, a rav. So... Just so you know, this is a fascinating piece of halakha because perkavot, much of it is halakha uh, and much of it is, uh, is hashkafa. So, yeah, one piece of it. Um, if you look throughout the Talmud, you will find no such requirement. This doesn't appear in the Gemara, this doesn't appear anywhere else in the Mishnah except for this one chapter, and here it's repeated twice. It doesn't appear in the Tur, it doesn't appear in the Shulchan Aruch, it doesn't appear in the Rambam. This obligation to uh, establish a rab for yourself. And so therefore, either we understand that Pirkei Avot is the one and only place it needs to appear because it's already been said, how many times do you have to repeat it? Or, if we go back to what may at one point have been the majority opinion on Pirkei Avot, the obligation to have a rab for yourself is really only an obligation for Rabbanim. In other words, I'm not necessarily required to 
go find someone, put a sticker on it, and this is my, you know, Ram, this is what I'm going to call to ask my questions, to get my answers, etc. This is one interpretation of the concept. Uh, today there's a, there's a big uh, mess uh, on this topic of, you know, who is a Rav and who is not, and uh, how does one become a Rav, and how does one determine or establish uh, a, a Rav uh, for him or herself. But the reality is that there may well be such an opinion that we don't even require such a thing. Judaism doesn't require such a thing of you. And that the, uh, the way the Rambam explains it, it sounds like this piece of advice is really for people who are giving halachic rulings that they themselves should have someone they can bounce ideas off of. So I had just the other day, what is today? Tuesday. Sunday. I got a very, very unfortunate uh, question from a very close and dear friend uh, about a complicated pregnancy. Is what it is. Um, looks like there was no heartbeat, and at some point, you know, it was necessary to uh, determine the pregnancy. I, that's not the kind of question that I would just uh, answer like this, you know, with a quick text message. I mean, think about these things, reflect, speak to a rav anyway, do what you, you know, can. What you, what you, the responsible thing to do is to is to double check, especially when it's something so important and so complicated and so difficult. Good advice would be to go find some So It's not necessarily uh, a universal application of the concept that everyone has to go find someone they call a rab. Uh, why do I ask this? Well, you know, it is an election here in America, and although I technically promised Johan I wasn't going to talk about politics... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't trust your promise. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's a chidul Hashem. I, I promised so many times it doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a funny thing, democracy, in the sense that many people who don't necessarily know what a government is or how government functions actually vote for the government. Government in a democracy uh, is basically appointed by people who don't necessarily know how governments are or how they function. Okay, that's the, the definition of democracy. Uh, when it comes to Torah, it's a very interesting question. <coughs> the chief rabbi of Israel should be appointed by whom, for example? Should he be appointed by other rabbis? Who chooses, or who, how do we define what a rabbi is at all? Who's eligible to vote? without disenfranchising anyone who's supposed to know and you know, maybe knows enough. How do you make such determinations? Does a relatively simple person have the authority or the knowledge to say this person's a rab and that one's not, or this one I'm going to follow and that one I'm not? So maybe this only makes sense in the context of that. It could be, look, you're a rabbi, you learn halakha, you recognize there's someone who's more knowledgeable than you, and so even when you make halakhic uh, rulings, there should be someone that you, you bounce them off, someone that you check them against. Uh, or it could well be just, you know, I'm making the, the case that it's not the way many of us might have been brought up uh, to think that everyone needs to have uh, a rav on call, you know, on retainer, that uh, this is just the person I go to with all my questions. It's a little bit challenging, though, Rabbi, because there's a lot of people in Israel who are, you know, the tira da ti. I can open up the Mishnah Brura, I can go on the website and, uh, you know, ask and answer any question that I want, and uh, I'm all, I'm all, I am my own rabbi. Absolutely. That, that's also pretty dangerous. I'm not done. <laughs> but I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> I'm glad that you asked the question. <coughs> the, uh, so Rashi explains this way. He says, look, uh, by the way, it's not even perfectly clear that the Pirush that we have on Perkevot, that we refer to as Rashi, is necessarily him. He was a prolific writer. The man accomplished something tremendous, which, by the way, the, the Rabbeinu Tam writes about him. He says that uh, writing a Pirush on the entire Talmud, he says, maybe even I could have done this. This is his grandson, his daughter's uh, son. He said, writing a Pirush the entire Tanakh, he said, that's tremendous. That really, to understand prophecies, to understand all the words that are used and the terms to refer back to the, uh, the Midrashim and the Gemara in order to explain what's going on. He said, this is a tremendous accomplishment. He wrote a tremendous amount. It happens to be, there are some tractates we don't have Pirush Roshi on. We have Rosh Bam, for example. There's a few that we just don't have Pirush Roshi on. So it's not so clear that the, the one that we call Roshi on Perkebos is necessarily him, probably from the same time period, maybe a little bit after, but... Uh, assuming that it is, uh, he explains Asenach Rav in Limud, meaning every Jew has the obligation to learn, and when it comes to learning, you should be learning from someone who is more knowledgeable than yourself. Not that I have the responsibility to bring each and every one of my life's questions to this individual. That's something ideally I should be able to do for myself. A five-year-old doesn't make decisions for him or herself. Obviously, there's some learning, there's some knowledge. It takes a little bit of experience. But the goal of <coughs> A Rav should not be that you come every day with a different question, but rather that you learn from the Rav how to learn. You learn how to understand, how to arrive at conclusions, how to ask the right questions, how to find the right answers. Uh, and then the Rimud is more successful. 
So Rashi explains, interestingly enough, by the way, if that's the Pirush, we hold the uh, Rashi, he, he mentions by the second Mishnah, the same way I explained above, I mean, to, to say they're both saying the same thing. Not that you have to have a Rav that tells you what to do, but that when it comes to learning, it's almost impossible to learn on your own, at least until you've learned a certain amount. It's something you should be doing with someone else. One step further than this is uh, Rabbeinu Yoram Igerundi, who says, Hasenech Rav, he means to say that when you're learning, you need to learn with someone else, period. Like I said, he's talking about the same person. Make a rab and, and find a friend. And he's saying, this is true even of someone who is inferior to you in, uh, in learning or inferior to you in, in intelligence. Learning with someone else, he says, you have a special, unique uh, bracha that the learning will last longer, you'll remember it better, you'll understand it more deeply if you, uh, if you learn with someone else. And so the person that I'm, with whom I'm learning, if I can't take what he says or what she says seriously, then I tune it out. So even someone, I could say, uh, an IQ test, if I score 102, this person scores a 98, so, you know, technically, uh, I might be a little bit smarter. But still, I have to consider what this person says to be the words of someone great, the one, someone with potential. Why? Because otherwise I'll just ignore it. I'm teaching myself, and teaching yourself is a good way to, to learn and understand nothing. That's Ruben Rami Migirondi. I'll give you a lot of examples of this. Uh, Rav Retbi, for example, used to tell us this is the, uh, the classic uh, trap, the classic snafu of the independent Kabbalist. You find someone that no one's ever heard of, and all of a sudden this individual becomes a Mikubal. All of a sudden this person has a radio station, or they have an office, they're taking money, they're giving barchot, they're selling barchot. And uh, I just had today a discussion with one of the Dayanim that I work with on uh, Gitim. And he said, uh, you know, I have a problem with this couple. And they're married, they got divorced, they got remarried, and then it's a very chaotic situation with a big mess. They're both previously married to somebody else. And uh, he didn't understand how the whole thing happened. And I said, oh, it's because Rabbi so-and-so, who's not really into the limitations of halakha, per se, <laughs> he considers himself more of a Kabbalist, sure, so they can get married. He didn't finish the divorce with his first wife. It doesn't matter. He can technically marry yeah, like in a whole mess because he assumes that he's just like he knows better than everyone else can do what he wants and do things on the side it's okay because there's a reward to be had for marrying people in complicated situations so a lot of these people that end up uh, be, being revealed as frauds or people who are uh, giving bad advice and unfortunately they're out there you have to be aware of this uh, a lot of them have this kind of independent streak to them I, I don't want to freak you out because today you know it's, it's hard to find people who care enough about Torah to want to learn it and, and find the right people, but uh, there was one particular example I can remember in Israel. Uh, in fact, I may as well mention his name, Nir ben Arzi. I don't know if you remember or don't remember, uh, but a really good friend of my brother-in-law has got a terrible, terrible piece of advice from him. And at the time, people didn't get it. You know, he's, he was smart and he was learned and he used to tell people things about themselves they didn't necessarily know, and, or people at least felt that way. And then sometimes he would say these really crazy, wild things that no one, like, if you had spoken to someone else, they'd say, that's crazy, why would you do that? So, uh, so you had situations like this, where this guy develops, he becomes independent, and apparently stops checking his ideas or his pieces of advice with someone else, and then it gets weird. He kind of detaches from society and goes off on a, on a weird streak, and, uh, and it was just a matter of time for all these weird things started coming out. And then one couple after another, is that what he told you? Because he told us something even weirder. And I was like, oh my God, that's weird. You think that's weird? Listen to that. Like, this guy just sat there day and night giving people really weird pieces of advice. So something to be said for, uh, for Rabbanim, having Rabbanim, that's for sure. Uh, whether or not it's an obligation for every individual, it's, just, it, it's an interesting question that, uh, that one should at some point ask. I'm going to take another little bit of a detour here and uh, get a little bit uh, biographical if that's okay with you. Anybody here know who Yoshua bin Parachya was? Or what else he was famous for? Yoshua bin Parachya. So he's not very prominently featured amongst the Hazal. We don't have that many Mishnayot in which he appears. Happens to be, and this is Pa'am Shani Shehid Grida, Masechet Sanadrim. There's a reference to him in the 11th chapter. This is a chapter that talks about Mashiach, about the end of time, about uh, Gobu Magog. So... Here we find out, the Gemara tells us that Yoshua ben Parachya was the Rav HaMuvhaq of Jesus. Yeshua HaNotzri. We call him Yeshua, we cut off the Ayin. 
I'm just putting that out there. I didn't make it up. You're looking at me like I'm reformed. No, that's true. That's in the Gemara itself. <laughs> the Gemara says, if Jesus had a rabbi, this was it. Was Yoshua ben Prachya. There's a story that appears in Masechet Sanhedrin. The story is, uh, I wouldn't say apocryphal, it's just that it appears in the, what we call the Hashmatot, which is the famous Tzenzura. That's when the, uh, the European rabbis, uh, who were constantly under the scrutiny of the Catholic uh, priests, Remember, Catholic priests were the only ones who knew how to read in Europe because they didn't want the common people to learn how to read. It's easier to control people who can't read. Look through the Middle East if you want proof of that. So they, uh, they, they took out all the portions in the Talmud that talk about or refer explicitly to Jesus and to his disciples. And Masechet Pesachim, Masechet Sanhedrin, there's some very explicit references to Avdah Zarah, has a few references too. Um, so the story is told, this is in Masechet Sanhedrin, it's actually a very famous uh, sugya, it's just that it gets cut off in the middle. And the Gemara makes a comment, it says, there are three things that one should always... Uh, have you ever familiar with this? Uh, you ever heard this before? Meaning the Gemara says there are three things, three concepts, three ideas, institutions that one should always be uh, bringing close with his right hand and, and you know, uh, repelling with his left, so to speak. Meaning, if your right hand is your strong hand, as it is by most people, most of your efforts should be uh, invested in bringing these things close to you. And then a little bit of effort in keeping a certain healthy, safe distance. And so what are the three examples given? One of them is uh, women in general, or your wife in particular, a little bit hard to say from the, the context, meaning it's important to have respect for women, obviously, for your wife, for sure, uh, but we don't have to be rock stars and hang out, you know, all the time with girls, etc. Not a good idea. It doesn't make for, it's a, it's a career for politicians, but we promised we weren't going to talk about them. Uh, <laughs> Then you have Qatan, um, with children, where it's great to spend time with children, but if you spend all your day with children, you run the risk of remaining a little bit childish. I mean, you have to set aside time for learning from people who are more or less your age and somewhat an intellectual par with you. Uh, you can spend the whole day with little kids, but you don't necessarily grow or develop from it. It's fun, it's exciting, it's rewarding, even with your own children. Just sometimes you say, okay, I want to deal with someone who knows how to read and write, someone who can teach me something, with experience. So it's nice to spend time with your kids, but you know, it's important that both you and they should be, should be learning, and not necessarily that you should always be watching cartoons. Uh, and the third example is the Yetzal Hara. Yetzal Hara needs to be uh, dealt with. You can't run away from it. You shouldn't be starving yourself. You shouldn't be fasting all the time. You shouldn't be uh, beating yourself up. Uh, but within certain limits. You know, there's certain things you have to know when your Yetzer is, is getting the better of you. Uh, it could be in terms of your appetite for food, it could be in terms of your appetite for, you know, male-female relationships. In this generation it could be male-male or female-female relationships. Let's, uh, let's politely move on. Um, it could be in terms of your appetite for power, for influence, for kavod. It could be in terms of uh, an inclination towards depression, anxiety, these are all these are tools of, uh, of Yetzir Hara. So, the Gemara goes on and explains that when it comes to, uh, to Yetzir Hara, there's an interesting story. And the story is that Yehoshua ben Parachya, we just mentioned now, uh, was traveling with his Talmid, whose name was Yeshua, right? By the way, the North African Jews never abandoned this name. In fact, the Rebbe has a son whose name is Yeshua. It's a name. We didn't, we didn't let them ruin it for us. So, uh, so he was traveling with him. They ended up going to uh, Alexandria in Egypt. And on their way, they stayed in a certain uh, inn. And Yeshu said to, or in the presence of Rabbi Yeshua ben Parachya, that the woman, the innkeeper, he made a comment about her eyes, that she had big, pretty eyes, or something like this. And Rabbi ben Parachya got very upset. And so he, uh, he banished him, he distanced him, he said, that's it, this guy, I'm done with him. No Talmud Chacham, no self-respecting rabbi should, uh, should say such a thing. If he's a student of mine, I have to, I have to uh, give him some distance. He's in the penalty box, as we say in hockey. Mm -hmm. So the Gemara explains that uh, twice uh, Yeshu came back and tried to make amends. He tried to do Teshuvah and to apologize in front of his Rav. Twice he was rejected. 
The third time that he came, Rabbi Yoshua ben Parachia was in the middle of Amidah, he was praying, apparently Mincha. And while he was praying, he made some kind of a gesture with his hand, so Yeshua comes to ask him for forgiveness, and he says to him something like this, like, you know, wait until I'm finished with my tefillah. By the way, someone explained to me that in Italian, apparently this is a very vulgar thing, it's like, like, who are you? You're nothing. Leave me alone. You're, you're worthless. <laughs> so maybe he was Italian, I wouldn't be surprised. So he says, uh, he makes some kind of a gesture where he, what he meant to say was, wait until I'm finished with my tefillah, like, I'm not, I'm not done yet. And he understands, he goes, oh, that's it. Third time he threw me out, he's never taking me back, I'm done. I may as well grow long hair and learn how to play guitar because it's over. This is, you know, my relationship with my rab is, is, is done. And uh, if I can't uh, succeed in uh, Torah and in, the, in terms of holiness, I, I may as well go all out. This part was censored? or This uh, part was removed from the Gemara by us. But thanks to the Sephardim, we still have it. Correct. Baruch Hashem, the Muslims are illiterate. It made it very easy to preserve. And anyway, they wouldn't care much about, the, about uh, Jesus, even if they knew how to read. Well, maybe maybe if they knew how to read, maybe they would. I don't know. They, they consider him to be something of a prophet, yeah. Uh, I don't know how seriously they take him, but they, they're not really into the cross or into any physical depictions. So it's a surah to... Mm, make pictures of Muhammad. They have a thing with physical representations. Anyway, the example is given by the Gemara that this is a, which is very telling, because the, the Gemara is telling you this about him himself, where he regrets having rejected him too hard, rejected him too much. So he would say, Yemin so you, you spend most of your time bringing people close. Sometimes it becomes necessary to punish someone or to distance yourself from someone, you know, someone says something crazy or offensive or insulting, take a break. But uh, he, he rejected him too hard. As a result of this, the Quran says he went on to, be, uh, to become a uh, black magic, uh, black magician, sorcerer type. He tried to convince people that uh, he has powers, and from here they made him a god, and, and you, know, you know the rest of the story. So that only began, according to the Quran, when, when this story transpired. It's really fascinating because uh, it didn't appear in most of the Gemarot that were learned over the generations. People, not everyone had access to these uh, stories that were kind of politely censored out. Uh, and they were kept in a book that was called Sefer Hashmatot. And this book was relatively secret. Eh, secret. Today you can buy it for about five or eight shkalim and uh, mashah. It's not a hard thing to get. Um, but that's how it was back then. If you happen to be looking for a set of shas, I, I, I personally enjoy the, uh, the Vagshal edition because they put most of these portions back in. They changed the font a little bit, it looks funny. Uh, but all of a sudden some of these comments about Rashid that make no sense when you see that it was referring to something that was there but was erased, all of a sudden it makes it makes a difference. But the uh, art scroll uh, with the translation art scroll, doesn't have that. No, because there it's is English, no translation there's of that, easy though. access to everyone. No. They and they were they were right not to include it. I think that was you know, much more sensible. Oh there's there's a concern even to this day that uh, right. I've put a little these, bit uh, sections back in. I'm going to break my promise. Uh, <laughs> someone, I, I, I feel it, I feel it it's coming up. Uh, someone made a comment on something, uh, so someone from Montreal posted something that had to do with Ted Cruz, and he, he tagged me on it. And this woman says, you know, I'm really afraid of, of Ted Cruz as a candidate. So I says, why? She says, because he's a really religious Christian, and probably he believes that, you know, all the Jews should go back to Israel, there's going to be a terrible war, Gog and Magog, Armageddon, and then they'll all have to accept him. Or something like, the next time he comes back, this the Jews have to accept him. You know, so I said, I don't necessarily believe that Jesus is the biggest threat that the state of Israel faces today, and like we can deal with him at some point or another. We kind of already did. Uh, but, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know that... Uh, that this, this danger is necessarily uh, weighs that heavily on who we should elect as a president or who we should, without me voicing an opinion, who I would vote for or who I wouldn't. I'm just saying, it's a concern that some people, I've heard a few people say this, that they don't like Ted Cruz. Really, he's good for Israel and he's good on a lot of other concepts, but because he's a frum, it's like an observant Christian, they, they suspect. Father's a priest or a pastor. Or yeah, that'd be active. I could think be. his father is an active priest. Could be. He, he's certainly a, a religious guy. Yeah, know? that's true. Which, by the way, may not be a bad thing either, but no, who am I to say? So, at any rate, um, there is still a very uh, curious relationship between religious Jews and religious Christians. 
uh, in the sense that a lot of Christians today do support the state of Israel. And for sure, there are people who have better and worse intentions uh, in, in why they do this. Um, it's, I think it's a good thing that we don't publicize too much of this. They could find it if they wanted to, if they want to, you know, either on the internet, I'm sure. Well, the literary but ones, everything, but like the, the priest, the, the, the higher priest, like the people who were in the Vatican or whatever, they, they, they read Hebrew, um, currently they study those texts. Could well be. Uh, we can always make the claim, you know what? It's apocryphal, what generation, who took this out, who put it back, do we know that it was maintained in its same yeah. uh, structure, uh, you know, who knows that it wasn't contaminated over the years, meaning, it's like it's whatever. Anyway, still with him. We, we don't write, we don't, uh, uh, oh, interestingly enough, the Rambam too is very heavily censored, by the way. If you look at the edition, the first edition to take these things, uh, to put them back, is uh, Frankel, the Shabtai Frankel edition of the, the Mishneh Torah. It's pretty ubiquitous, the brown, the big brown covered one with gold uh, letters on it. Uh, so one of the things that they tried to do, they didn't do enough of it, unfortunately, but there are a lot of cases where, um, you know, it'll say, like, Ovet Kochavim, it should just say Goy, any non Jew would have the same status, and things like this. It's, it's a little bit annoying to read otherwise, but... Um, you just get used to these things. So, Yosha ben Parachia, I'm just putting that out there. When it comes to Parachia Avot, you find that a lot of the Pirushim do actually make biographical references and will tell you, you know, it's not for nothing that this particular Rav said this or was known for saying this. If you look into his life story, you'll find there are details. Uh, it's not like this is the only thing that he ever said. It's just that if he was going to make a one Mishnah contribution to Parachia Avot, these are the things he would like to leave us, you know, from his personal experience, from his knowledge and understanding. And clearly, uh, the Gemara, as far as we have it, uh, seems to imply that he regretted uh, not judging more favorably. And so, maybe he tried to push that a little bit, uh, a little bit harder. So, I have a question. I, sure. I don't really understand your analogy. You said that, okay, you said there were, there are um, three things, right? That we want to pull in with the right and then push away a little bit with the left. Right. In other words, you should be close to, but wife, not too close. Right, right. So I get the first two, the wife and the kids. Or maybe women in general. Right. Okay, so yeah. Women and then children, right? And then the evil inclination. Yes, it's hard. It's hard. So why would you want to pull that in more than you push it away? Yeah, it. The definition of it's hard is something that we probably should discuss at some point. Uh, your appetite for food is, is like part of Chazal's understanding of it's hard. Meaning your more material inclinations. Distancing yourself entirely from this world, or just fasting, is, is going to lead to your death. So it's important to eat. It's important not to cut it to the microgram. You know, you want to eat and like a little bit more, and just to, to be on the safe side. But you don't want to go all out. You don't want to exaggerate. Mm -hmm. So you're basically, you're constantly keeping these relationships in check. You know, you do have to eat. You do have to drink. You do enjoy olam hazeh. Just don't enjoy it too much. You know, keep a little bit of a, of a distance. Yes, it's true that you'll find that Chazal gave as a... Maybe we praise certain Sadiqim that benefited very little from Olam Hazeh, but that's exceptional individuals at a relatively old age or people who had an exceptional level of understanding. You trying to imitate that is going to cause a lot more damage than you could. So. Hmm. The idea is that, you know... And it's, it's not so clear what the Quran means, by the way, because, you know, was Jesus guilty of, of being, like, too close to his Yetzir? I mean, did he walk around whistling like a construction worker to every woman that he saw? He made a comment once. I don't, he was shocked. I don't know. She was surprised that uh, this woman had... Uh, he was in Egypt. I don't know how good-looking Egyptian women are. I mean, mm. it's like, oh, there's a good-looking one. How'd that happen? Like, well, I don't know. I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't tell you. It, it just... You know, it seems like uh, the two of them, meaning that Jesus was a little, was a little bit... said something he shouldn't have said, but that it should, the punishment shouldn't have been as harsh or as severe as it was. And that uh, because he, he rejected him so so hard the first two times, the third time there was room for misunderstanding. Like he just assumed he wasn't going to be accepted, and that's all. The, the wheels came off the wagon. So um, we're going to fast forward to Mishnah Tetzayin. Rabban Gamliel Omer, Asel Echarav, who is Tarek Min Asafek, Wal Torbe La Aser Omadot. So Rabban Gamliel has a slightly different approach. According to uh, the commentary that we've come to know and love as Rashi, he, it sounds like he's literally saying the same thing. You need to learn Torah from someone who really knows it, and you don't want to make any mistakes. You don't want to pass on or transmit any mistakes. Asel Kharab becomes a big deal. Histalek min asafik. Histalek min asafik means to... Literally, by the way, in Hebrew, histalek means what? To cut out. Uh, that's karet. 
That's good. You're thinking Rosh Hashanah. We have Selek Mashu. Because there is something else. She karatu evenu. We stalku evenu. The Selek Mashu is like to get it out of here. To get it. In modern Hebrew, it's taken on that sense. Uh, in in Aramaic, Selek means to rise. Oh, you say kasav kadatach. Kasav kadatach, like it should yale al datcha. It should rise onto your thoughts. Come to mind, right? So lesalek means to um, to lift or to to rise above something, right? Kad salik Rabbi Zera, when Rabbi Zera was making aliyah, as he was rising, as he was ascending, you know, you're going from Babylonia to Eretz Yisrael. So his talik min asafek doesn't literally mean run away from doubts. It means rise above them. Meaning, you know, it's an interesting etymological point. And he's coming from a different position altogether. Uh, clear enough, you should establish someone uh, for yourself as a uh, rabbi. If these pieces of advice are related, and the tendency is to believe that they are, then your, uh, your attachment to a rav, uh, according to the Rambam, especially when you're learning Torah, meaning for people who are learned, people who like to become more learned, this should assist you in overcoming situations of doubt, right? Very interesting. Today, when you see a rabbi, usually you assume this is someone who is uh, apolitical or someone who's just jello, <laughs> very soft, very pudgy, very easy to manipulate, uh, someone who doesn't tell anybody anything, anything they don't want to hear. And well, uh, a part of this... Not just reform rabbis, it's a lot of Israeli rabbis too. Right. I, I promised I would minimize the yeah. political yeah. references. I won't tease you. I won't, I won't attempt to. to. Don't, don't feed the bears. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, we have this impression that, you know, rabbis are just like soft people who say nice things to nice people and never, never bother anyone or say anything they don't want to hear. If you look at the Nevi'im, if there is an example of, uh, of Rabbanut in the Tanakh, the Nevi'im are, are experts at telling people things they don't want to hear. At correcting them, at rebuking them, and getting uh, killed at the hands of them. Which is fine. A rabbi would rather be dead than uh, be a soft pushover, a real rabbi anyway. So, Histalek Minas uh, is, is, you know, the, the more learned you are, the less room there should be for doubt in your mind. I'll give you a really good example of this, because if there's anyone in, in relatively recent history who despised all kinds of sfikot, it was the Vilna Gaon. Right? It became very popular, a little bit of history here. We just came out of Pesach, so we have to uh, uh, make references to what's, uh, to what's real in, uh, in current events. Uh, so when we say Ashkenazim, we're referring to the Germans, literally the Germans, right? Like Shlomo Ayash. Anyone who was born in Germany would be Ashkenazi, but also anyone who follows the teachings or the customs of the Jews in what you go to Nachman, you're not never mind, I'm not gonna <laughs> these political things keep on coming up, I'm trying to avoid them. So <laughs> so uh, an Ashkenazi is not literally someone who was born in or raised in Germany, but rather someone who follows the customs and traditions of Germany. We say Sephardi, what does it mean? The Iraqim or Sephardim, technically the Elot Mizrach, they're from the, the East. But these are people who follow the halachot that were taught by, for the most part, the Rambam, who lived in Spain, and they, they adopted these customs or they adjusted their customs in order to fit. The Jews who were living in Germany uh, had a very clear tradition on a lot of things. And as the Jewish community spread, because for most of uh, the, the common era, most of the period since the destruction of Beit HaMikdash, Jews weren't allowed to live in Slavic regions. They just killed them. They didn't want them there. Slowly but surely, the Germans started to conquer land and move east, and the Jews went with them. They exchanged money, they spoke languages, they, they helped them uh, to spread a little bit to the east. And they started to enter what's called the Pale of Settlement. Basically, they, they reached as far east as Poland and started moving towards later uh, generations, Ukraine and Russia. But there are no Jewish communities to speak of in Poland during the... Uh, 13th, 14th century, I mean, maybe the 16th century, it starts to appear. So all of a sudden, when the Jews reach Poland, they start asking questions about some of the customs they had in Germany. And I'll give you a couple of examples. In Germany, everybody, or every man who reaches the age of Bar Mitzvah wears a talit. If you are German or no one loves someone who is, you know that they don't have any questions in Germany. There's no machlokit here. It doesn't matter if you're from northern Germany or southern, southern Germany. You reach the age of Bar Mitzvah, you put on a talit, like, like the Sephardim, like pretty much all the ancient communities, Temanim too. 
when the Jewish communities in Poland learned a little bit differently, and they said, you know, there's a reference in the Gemara that there was a Rav who wasn't married, and one of the Rabbanim asked, why isn't he wearing a Talit? And because he's not married, he said, oh, if he's not married, then I don't want to see him until he's married. Like, he makes a comment that, you know, like, too old to not be married, you should go get yourself married. So maybe from here we can understand that it's not so clear that if you're not married, you should wear a Talit, so we're not going to wear one. And the Germans were furious. What do you mean you have a suffix, you have a doubt? Like, maybe yes, maybe no. You're, you're, you all came from here in Germany. Here in Germany, everybody puts on a tarit before they're married. How did you come up with a doubt in our tradition that didn't exist? It was clear that everyone in Germany was wearing a tarit. How come all of a sudden you came up with a new custom where people don't wear them? You want another example? Chametz and Matzah on, uh, on Pesach, right? In Germany, it was clear that once you bake Matzah, you can do whatever you want with it. Right? Remember, it wasn't the Timanim who invented matzah balls. The Ashkenazim invented them, and they ate them, and they enjoyed them. And they ate them one year after the other. All of a sudden, you have, this is already further into uh, the, it's in the, it's the very late 18th century. You have Jews living in Ukraine, Russia, etc., who start asking questions. Chabad is one of the first. Uh, what happens if there was a little bit of flour that wasn't really mixed in with the rest of the matzah, and then we baked it, but it's still the flour is kind of raw. It's, it's you know, something happens like when you bake bread, you can put flour on the bottom, and then when you buy it, you can feel the loose grains. Mm -hmm. So maybe if that wasn't properly baked, from the Gemara, by the way, it seems clear that once you bake it, it's not considered hamitz anymore. Uh, but maybe, as it's clear that Chazal ate fruits and vegetables and put things on their matzah, but maybe... Uh, there was some loose flour that wasn't baked, and therefore it should be a sur for us to put this into soup or to put it into uh, juice or into gravy with meat or something, uh, because it might become hametz on Pesach. So the Vilna Gaon, who passed away in 1799, lived throughout the, the overall majority of the, uh, the 18th century, so he heard this, and he said, this is crazy. This is crazy. This never happened. This never was part of our tradition. We don't have a doubt as to whether this is permissible or forbidden, we know for a fact that it's permissible, it's mutar. You want to invent a humra, you want to invent a stricture where none previously existed, and it's not like my grandfather didn't know any better, and he ate his matzah with soup only because he was ignorant. Grandfather was a And so were the entire, you know, the whole genealogy of how they learned. So he said, okay, I heard that some of the Hasidim, specifically uh, the Alta Rebbe, the, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, was telling his students not to eat their matzah with anything moist or wet because it might become hametz on Pesach. The Vilna Gaon says, no problem. He took a jar with water, he took a piece of matzah, he stuck it in it, and he put it in his window. He said, here's what I think of your custom. <laughs> Which sounds pretty pretty gutsy, right? This is, that's not, remember I was talking about the rabbi made of Where jar? Where the rabbis <laughs> are just... <laughs> Right, this isn't, ah... So this is the Villagon who has zero tolerance, zero tolerance for Svikot. If someone comes to you and tells you, really, I'm not sure, there's an opinion like this, an opinion like that, we should be strict, he will tell you, this is an Arab, this guy doesn't know how to learn. You learn, you know, you understand, maybe there's a small handful of cases that just aren't clear, or sometimes we have different words or different versions, or the words are in different order in the Gemara, I mean, it's a rare occasion. We actually have a real Safik. And you should know that many of them in Hagim, the Vilna Gaon himself reverted back to old German customs in deference to what used to be the tradition, even though he's living in Lithuania, uh, as opposed to adopting the newer, like some of the, the, so the Hasidut, he wasn't a big fan of Hasidut in general. Um, but that was an example. He studied Kmina Safek, in his mind, if you learn Torah and you know what you're doing, there are no Sfechuts. You know, and if there's a Safek, it's not because the Torah doesn't know what to do in a case like this, it's because you don't know what to do in a case like this. You haven't learned enough. And so doubts only come into your mind when you, when you don't know enough or when you don't have conviction. In other words, if we were to redefine the concept of learning, when you learn something and you're good at it, you don't have doubts. You know what needs to be done. A good teacher studies from the books, you get a little bit of practical experience, and you know what to do when a situation comes up in the classroom. Not, oh my God, that child's crying, or this girl had a bad day, or you know one of the kids didn't show up, and now I have to make up a lesson. Okay, but you figure it out. People have done this before you, and you move on. Life moves on. Someone who knows what he or she is doing, knows how to fix mistakes, you know how to, how to correct situations. So uh, this is the, the Vilna Gaon's classic definition of uh, learning, especially when it comes to Tamadei Chachamim. Uh, a, a rabbi is supposed to be someone who, who 
is allergic to doubts. Someone who is allergic to these weaselly situations where you give an answer without giving an answer, non-committal, you know, uh, I'm thoughts. not sure, I think this, or where you say, look, it could be like this, it could be like that, you'll be strict. You'll be strict. You could be strict on yourself. What, these people have to, extra money, extra effort, Pesach has to be more expensive, more difficult, they have to work, you know, harder in order to, uh, to live up to your uh, strictures that really come from nowhere but, uh, but doubt, but a lack of understanding. There's a famous story on this uh, particular topic uh, referring to, uh, to the baking of matzot. It used to be in Europe that uh, baking matzah was very much uh, a woman's uh, occupation. Women baked anyway, and they were very quick with, uh, with flour and water. And so everywhere, all over Europe, everybody was buying their matzah from women. Most particularly, uh, it, it happened to be uh, widowed women. A woman who needed the extra paranasah would go to the bakery, leave someone, leave a relative with the kids, Go bake for uh, 7, 8, 10, 12 hours a day, and then come back. So women knew how to bake matzah because they're baking matzah for thousands of years, and nobody complained, nobody said anything about it. One year, the students of, of uh, uh, I think it's of uh, Shmuel Sanatar, the son of Rabbi Sarar Sanatar, the famous founder of the Musar movement, which was the Lithuanian response to the Hasidut, or if you want, the Mitnagdin, who became basically Hasidim of the other side. Um, so his students came to him and they said, you know, Every year we're looking for uh, for new humrot. Like we want to be tamid hachamim, and we want to be extra careful and, and get the matzot that are beyond all doubts, that are that are beyond any reasonable doubt, that are the highest hashgacha. Uh, I said, what what humra should we incorporate this year? Like what's the new, you know, uh, the new popular style of, uh, of humra that we should adopt? So he said, I think a really good humra would be not troubling the poor widow who's baking your matzot. <laughs> Not giving her crazy requests or crazy demands or crazy expectations because the woman is working in order to support her family and you're making her life bitter and miserable, even more bitter and more miserable than it already is, by trying to tell her, do me a favor, I want my matzot extra crispy, extra burnt, extra thin, extra thick. So he said, eh, your matzot are kosher, it's fine. You were kosher, you know, half an hour ago. Let's just leave it and, and not push, uh, not push too hard. So this is uh, Rabban Gabriel when it comes to uh, Rabbanut. It's not just a matter of. Uh, learning and uh, knowing what to do, uh, and then being able to judge people uh, favorably. I'll get back to that in a second. Ramon Gamliel is telling you, you need to have a Rav, or hopefully you should be learning from a, uh, from a Rav. Uh, your goal in learning should be to become so proficient, to become such a baki, such an expert, in what it is that you're learning that you don't have spikot, you don't leave room for, uh, for doubts. And this is very interesting. means... Ma'aser, you're familiar with the concept, right? Turma ma'aser means literally giving a tenth. So the Torah tells you, uh, biblically, it's only, it only applies to olives, grapes, and grains, that you take, uh, really it's more than 10%, but you take 10%, give it to the Lewi, Lewi gives 10% to the Kohen, and we have this system of uh, ma'aser. The Hebrew word eser means ten. Ma'aser literally means uh, to take a tenth, to tithe, they call this in, uh, in English, and to, uh, to make sure that the Kohanim and Levim get what the Torah promises them because that's how they live, because they don't have land in Israel, so our agriculture supports them. When you don't know if Tumot or Ma'asrot have been taken from something, or you don't measure it, you don't weigh it, you don't know, let's say, how many grains you have. That's by weight. So if I have a ton, or a ton and a half, or a ton and a quarter, how much should I take in order to get to the Levi and the Kohen? So he's telling you, don't be so quick to take Ma'asr from estimations. Right? Omdan in Hebrew is like an approximation, an estimation, right? Omdan hadat. How much do I have? Maybe it's 100 pounds, 102, 105, 110. Yalla, let's be strict. Why? Because I have a safiq. Why do you have a safiq? Why don't you go measure it? I sell meat. So what? I just I, I eyeball it? That uh, filet mignon? At least five pounds, five and a quarter. <laughs> Something like this. One of my students from uh, YU grew up in uh, Tangiers. Nonetheless, a very funny guy. And uh, he said that once he was uh, driving with some of his friends, they had a vacation. So they're tearing down one of these Moroccan highways, right? I'm sure it was in great shape and it was a very safe road. But he's driving really fast down one of these uh, like one-lane Moroccan highways. And a police car starts following him. You know, he puts on his lights and he pulls him over. So he says, officer, I'm sorry, did I do something wrong? He says to him, of course you did something wrong. He says, what did I do? He said, you were speeding. He said... Officer, do you know how fast I was going? He says, the officer says to him, if I was doing 120, you were doing at least 140. 
<laughs> he just makes something out of nowhere. He's like, well, you were driving faster than me, so it must be like 20 kilo, uh, kilometers an hour that you were going too fast, which is really just a reference to how much money he has to put in his driver's license when he gives it to him, and then you know, everything's going to be okay. You buy me breakfast, and I'll, I'll leave you alone. So, yeah, this is halakha. We're not, uh, we should not be in the habit of doing things out of a safiq. So, in the first example, we said, you know, histerichim in a safiq. Avoid these situations that are doubtful. Be clear. Try to find an answer. If you haven't found one, keep on looking. Another great uh, teaching from Rav Retbi on this topic, he used to say this and repeat it a lot, that it's much spiritually healthier to live with a good question than with a bad answer. I have lots of good questions. There are lots of things I just can't figure out. I don't know about human nature, about responsibilities, about expectations. There's just lots of things I don't know. I'm okay living with a good question. Because a good question, it means you're thinking, you're looking for the truth, uh, your experience has taught you things or has proved things wrong, and, and you're curious about it. When you give someone a bad answer, you're basically trying to close the door of the truth. You're trying to say, yeah, you know, sometimes bad things happen to good people, but it's just life. Suck it up, have some apple juice, you'll be okay. okay. That's a terrible answer. You can say it's an amazing question. To tell someone that they're asking a good question or that they have a real question is to give them a confirmation. It's to give them support. It's to say you're thinking correctly. You're thinking right. You're thinking at all. <laughs> your, your mind is working. You're trying to make sense of this world. It's a good, happy, positive thing. To give people bad answers is basically to try to discourage them from thinking. You're trying to say, uh, that's a good question. Here's an answer. Like, leave me alone. You know, instead of trying to really analyze this. We used to ask questions. Sometimes Rabbi would say, I don't know, that's a good question. I have to think about it. I have to ask someone. Or have, you know, just modeling that kind of behavior for me. What do you mean? This man is uh, 75, 76 years old, and he still doesn't know everything. Like, there's still someone he would have to go to for advice, or he has to ask the question to someone else. Eh? So if you ask a question like that, you're a superstar. What are you kidding me? <laughs> I asked a question that he couldn't answer. Come on, Azman, I could retire now. <laughs> I just hit the jackpot. It's a very, uh, a very educational uh, concept. It's okay to have questions. And that's the other part. By the way, not every question gets an answer right away. What are you going to do? Not a profit. So you have a question. And so the question kills you. That's it. Life ends today. Suicide at 11.59. I turn into a pumpkin if I don't get an answer. All right. So you wake up tomorrow. Think about it again. Maybe you get an answer from someone else. Maybe uh, you know, your questions evolve over time. So it's not... You, know, you should learn a lot and come to a point where you have less doubts... Don't be lazy. What are you telling you? Don't be lazy. Even though you have a halachic solution for something, don't be afraid to get into it. Don't be afraid to get your fingers dirty. So how much grain do I have? Bah, round it up. You know, I'll give a little bit of extra ma'asir. Laziness is an unsustainable form of life. Right? I promise I'm not going to talk about socialism. And I won't. But when you get used to doing things in a quick or easy way, when you get used to saving yourself work, you're not really flexing any of the good muscles in your neshama. So if I know I have to do something and I have to do it, the, good, the right response would be get up and do it. Put in a little bit of effort, find the number that you're looking for, do your division, whatever, and you'll figure out what 10% or what 11% of it is. When you get lazy and you get in the habit of ignoring situations or looking for a fast solution, you start to degenerate intellectually. You start to fall apart. You stop thinking. You stop, you know, this is uh, typical, unfortunately, uh, but my experience has taught me, of people who learn a lot and who haven't had experience with people. Because when you're working with people, people bring you real questions, they have real problems, they need real answers. When you're learning from a book, you can say, you know, oh, that'd be really crazy. What would I do if, uh, you know, a guy got amnesia and his wife needs a get and he doesn't know that he's married to him? Oh, yeah, whatever, it's a good question. I'll put a bookmark, I'll, I'll find it some more time. Question comes up now! What do you do? Crazy story, this is true. I was in Beijing once. So, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it could be that <laughs> I don't <laughs> have that <laughs> much experience. <laughs> that you're... <laughs> this yeah. is true. How exactly we balance it out is right. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't have experience, if you don't use your Chochmah, that's what the Mishnah is telling you, right. it's not going to last. One of the craziest Gitin that I ever had to write. Wacky story. I'm sitting in a, in, in a bedding. We, we wrote one get, and usually we try to stack them <coughs> two or three at a time because that's yeah, to get people together and you have to coordinate it. So, this, uh, this guy comes in, nice Israeli guy, he's, looks like he's in his 50s maybe, 
and uh, his wife, I don't know if she's American or Israeli, anyway, so we sit down, he comes in, he gives us uh, the, the uh, directions, so I, I, if I'm writing the get, I'm writing it for him, I'm his uh, shariah, I'm his agent. So uh, you, Vidan Ben Akiva Moshe, you be my uh, my agent to write a get uh, for me, you know, Yitzchak Ben Abraham, and for my wife, uh, whatever, Sarah, but uh, Yaakov, uh, and write one get, or even more, even up to a hundred, until you find one kosher and you give it to me. It's like a standard thing. So he gives me the directions, and then he leaves, and it's okay. He made me his agent to write the get, and then to give it to his wife. So I have two jobs. I write him and give it. After he leaves, his wife starts talking. She's like, you know, it's such a weird, strange thing that he, he started to, to lose it. I'm thinking to myself, lose it? Oh, I look like a normal guy. So she's talking to me while I'm writing, and I'm like, you know, so what do you mean by, uh, by lose it? She's like, he used to walk up to people, and he'd be like, look at that. It's a nice jacket. You like it? When are you giving it back? <laughs> like, like, it's mine. And he'd be like, yeah, you like that car, don't you? So do me a favor, bring it back. You know, at some point, because I want to use it again. <laughs> People he'd never seen before, he would just think, just assume they're wearing his jackets and they're wearing his shoes and they're borrowing his car. Very strange thing. So at some point, the Dayan that I'm writing with says to her, listen, you know, like, stop, don't, we don't, we don't want to <laughs> hear these stories because if he's really crazy, then, like, maybe the get's going to be a, a problem. Assume that he snaps in and out of it, you know, he, he has his moments, but, uh, <laughs> so, you know, you see a situation like that, and you say to yourself, wow, I have to go through every single thing I've ever learned about anything <laughs> in order to be able to write and get like this, sign it and deliver it to her because, you know, just because sometimes he's losing it, sometimes he's with it, so etim uh, shotei, etim halim, you know, we have like someone who, who, who falls in and out of sanity, sometimes he's crazy, sometimes he's not, he's competent or sometimes incompetent, Maybe you have halachot, somebody's drunk, if he's really drunk, if he's kind of drunk, if he's, you know, totally gone, if he still has some of his decision-making abilities with him. Uh, so it, it's very, uh, very powerful when you get involved in halacha and you really get it down to the details of it, you keep your learning sharp. And that's how you help to avoid situations like estimations, approximations, or, uh, or doubts. Another good example of this was that I had a really good friend when I was in elementary school. Unfortunately, I was totally not religious, but that's not the point. Uh, there was a time when he was, and he went to, uh, to Yeshiva, and he was really grappling, like, what do I do when I go back to my parents' uh, home? Because I think his, his parents were, like, conservative-ish, his father and mother was, I don't remember. Uh, and basically what he was trying to say it was, like, his parents aren't so careful about kashrut, and there are certain things, not so easy, and how do we manage? And so the expression that he, that he used was, so I asked him, you know, how he, what he's going to do, and he says to me, you know, it, it really requires all of my Torah to be able to eat in my mother's kitchen. <laughs> he wasn't saying I'm not going to eat there. He wasn't saying I'm going to make a fight and make a machloket, I'm going to make my parents miserable. What he was saying was, like, you need to know so much in order to know that there are opinions that you could rely on and what you can deal with and what you can't deal with. It's, it's like, I need to be really learned in order to be able to do this. So you would say, the more learned you are, you'd expect to know, just don't eat there. You know, it's like McDonald's. No, no, no rely on this, I can trust that, I can work with this, I can, eh. so, <laughs> like, the more you learn, the more you understand. There are certain situations you have to navigate, and you, know, you don't want to be stuck in too many doubts. At the same time, you can't always control the entire situation and all of the variables, so, so you learn. This is what learning is all about. It's trying to, trying to work it out. So we have uh, the Rav in terms of, you know, as expressed by one uh, who helps you learn, one who helps you uh, lift yourself, the way Rebbe used to put it, uh, a real Rav is someone who knows you better than you know yourself. And someone who can give you better advice than you can give yourself. Because it's really easy to lie to yourself. You can really tell yourself all kinds of stories. You could say, I'll do this, I'll do that, and then, you know, if this succeeded, it's because of this, if that failed, it's because of that. But someone who understands you and knows uh, how to speak to you and how to get you where you want to be, that seems to be the example of Rebbe Yoshev and Parachya. Rabban Gamliel, who seems to be a little bit more in the yeshiva, so to speak, in the, the Beit Midrash, is basically advocating for, uh, for knowledge, for clarity, uh, and for this being one of your saving, uh, I like to use the Christian term, saving graces, but you know, one of the things that can help uh, get you out of complicated, doubtful, curious situations before you even get into them. Lots of learning, lots of understanding, be clear, and ultimately you won't have too many situations where you're just uh, rounding up, rounding down, or in doubt, and have to be uh, strict or lenient. Without, without making necessarily any, uh, any sense of it. So, let's take a quick break for uh, pizza and questions. You know, particularly